Hey, this is Jacob Evan. Thanks for tuning in. A few months ago, I made a video about dreams and dreaming. I basically framed it as a guide to dreaming and dream interpretation, and because of how I framed the title and the introduction, I imagine there were people that got the wrong idea. I know from experience that it is easy to see a video title and think that I know what the video is about just from that, and then I might find out later that I had misinterpreted, and I suspect that may have happened with the dreaming video based upon some of the responses that I got to it, and presumably my ultimate point in it was not actually transmitted as I had intended. So for this video, I wanted to take a converse approach to the subject. First, I want to refer to some of the passages in the Torah on the subject of prophecy and dreams, and then I want to talk about some modern-day practical scenarios and applications, both in applying it to other people and to oneself, as the case may be. And I want to talk about some of the things that we might learn from the nature of false prophecy. What does the Torah say about dreaming and prophesying? The main passages on the subject include Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, and Numbers 12, 6 through 8, although there are a few other passages that refer to each. Based upon this, prophesying can be legitimate, and it was indicated that it would happen again in the time to come, in the time after the Torah. Prophetic dreams can also exist. However, there is a major consideration that must go along with these things. There is a high level of seriousness and real consequence to getting it wrong. Really, that should go without saying if a person is cognizant of what the text says regarding people who prophesy falsely. Now, most people are going to think that Deuteronomy 13 doesn't apply to them as far as their own behavior. But even if that is the case, the end of Deuteronomy 18 could, and there are still heavy consequences for that in the Torah observant nation, in the Torah society. A person can prophesy by the correct Elohim and then be mistaken about the prophecy and still experience capital punishment over it under such a legal system. I think that in the modern day, or in most any time in history, People have been starving for interaction with Elohim, with the Creator, and people understandably want the guidance and the validation and the encouragement that would come through prophetic interaction, or even that which seems to come through a false prophetic interaction, because a person can imagine a prophetic interaction and still get the same feelings out of it as if it were real, at least for the short term. And this could apply to other people that we are listening to outside of us. And it could apply when a person thinks this is going on within themselves. Once again, prophecy is something which can happen. I do believe that it can legitimately happen today. But for every single experience of a true prophecy, I don't know how many thousand or more false experiences there are. Also, I think the very definition of prophecy has been undermined by certain teachings or practices among certain communities. It is sometimes common for people to claim that God, that Elohim, told them something, or that God has supposedly spoken on something, or that God supposedly spoke to them through a dream. And these claims will sometimes be stated as such a light thing that you would think they were a common occurrence and as if there were no consequence attached to getting it wrong. And one way I've heard this framed was that according to some people, there is no such thing as prophecy anymore, but it is just prophetic gifts. And for whatever reason, a prophetic gift is not subject to a test of truth or falsehood like prophecy is, even though in reality it is still the same thing. That consideration for the weight of presuming to speak in the name of the Creator appears to be almost entirely absent in most of the circles that I've been aware of or have associated with. It seems that most groups have one of two general approaches to the subject of prophecy. One approach tends to be strongly encouraging prophecy, 
and believing almost any of it that the group may come across or even just hear about. And that might either be because of an understandable desire for guidance or validation or encouragement, or it might be because of focusing on particular non Torah texts like certain parts of the New Testament. And the other approach tends to be discouraging most all of it, that if anything claiming to be prophecy comes up in the modern day, there is an automatic disbelief of it, which is also understandable. But it is almost arbitrarily so. That is also usually accompanied by the acceptance of certain non Torah books of prophecies, without much question. So it doesn't appear to come down to a real test in either of those cases or in either of those general approaches. It is more about just being inclined toward it in general or being inclined toward it only in certain contexts, not based upon any real test. And I would suspect since people probably haven't changed much since ancient times even, I imagine those two approaches could have easily been prominent back in that day as well. There were probably people back in the midst of the events of the Tanakh or the New Testament that probably believed every single prophecy they heard without any discrimination. And there were probably other people that denied every single modern prophecy of the time that was occurring. It's easy to think that we are so far removed from the way things were back then, but I really don't think so. And as I've pointed out on some of my more recent videos, such as my video about Paul, or my video about David, or my video about the Sermon on the Mount in the Shame Tov Hebrew Matthew, I think that a lot of people coming to the Torah today share a certain way of thinking as we come to the awareness of the Torah. For me, I know I wanted to figure out very quickly which books I accepted and which ones I didn't. And I wanted to do this decisively from an early point in my studies, and the reality is that I didn't know that much about the details of the Torah commands as I was doing this. And while I could refer to the works of others to see the criticisms of Paul, especially since Paul is one of the most obvious culprits if we're willing to see it, those legitimate critiques are not as present for some of the other figures because so much of this is just taken for granted as being pro Torah and as being integral to traditional belief. So I got the misguided idea early on that I would just look for generalized statements about the law, about the Torah, and make some assessment just based upon that, based upon whether there's something favorable said about it. I don't know why I got the idea that was okay, I guess I just hadn't become skeptical of people other than Paul at that point. And hearkening back to our ideas about the past, I once again wouldn't be surprised if something similar went on back in the day as well, because it is clear that people lost awareness of the Torah very quickly. Just read the book of Judges. People may have generally believed in the same Elohim at some point, or at least some of them did, but they certainly developed some strange new views about him which were not in line with the Torah and oftentimes are not even criticized in those very books. And beyond the testing of something according to the Torah commands, there is more to testing prophecy than just that. Even if I had known enough about what the Torah said for itself at that time, to make some type of true assessment on that basis, to actually assess if prophecies were consistent with the commands or not, even that is not a full or true test of a prophet, and that misses a major point which is highlighted in Deuteronomy 18, the question of whether a prophecy comes to pass or not. As we know, just because a person personally believes in the Torah or personally thinks that it should be followed, that does not grant the person free license to prophesy. Not every prophecy that a person utters will necessarily come true, nor does it mean for past prophets that it came true. Based on what I have witnessed in the modern day, a person can certainly appear righteous and can speak in favor of following the Torah in full, and then go on and prophesy something that doesn't come true. I'm sure that that is obvious. And as a side note, there is another element that might be obvious about prophecy, but is sometimes overlooked. Prophecies can be misinterpreted. A prophecy might actually be legitimate, it might actually be true, 
but then sometimes people will decide on a particular interpretation for it and ignore all other possibilities and then speak about their interpretation of the prophecy instead of just speaking about the wording of the prophecy itself. And then if the interpretation doesn't come true, the prophecy might wrongly be assumed to be false. This can especially be the case whenever we are peripheral to these events, whenever we are just hearing about it second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand. While it is true that people are often very resistant to recognizing a false prophecy and will often double down on the false prophecy instead, the opposite situation can also take place. Next, let's reconsider this one approach that I mentioned, the approach of dismissing all modern-day prophets, this approach often does not apply skepticism to ancient prophets because those ancient prophets have been traditionally accepted. So there is this trick of the mind that can take place as we are thinking about these things. For whatever reason, when we're dealing with modern day individuals, a person who is still alive, a person that claims to interact with the Creator, we sometimes see it in a different light from individuals that are no longer alive, that are ancient, that we may know very little about. The Torah commandments indicate that we are supposed to test the prophets which come after Moses, such as referred to in Deuteronomy 18. So that would include anyone coming after that time. While it certainly could be said that believing in the Torah is a matter of belief, it is a matter of faith, it is a matter of just accepting it because of our beliefs or whatever reason that we hold for that. While that is the case, there is also this expectation in the Torah of testing later prophets. Even though that is the case, for some reason our mind can think that the way that we handle the book of Ezekiel, for example, is different from the way we handle some person on social media today. A person that might have kind of a strange name that acts kind of weird, over the top, claims that the Creator supposedly told them such and such. The reality is that if it weren't for the prophecy that exists in the book of Ezekiel about adding new Torah, if it weren't for that one example, we are often in a better position today to test modern-day people who claim to be prophets when they are still alive today and can speak directly to us and when we can see whether their prophecies actually came true or not, where we can see that, okay, they said this, I know they said this at a certain point in time, and then yes, the event took place after that point in time. We can see those things from a modern-day prophet that's speaking now, but when it comes to something like a prophetic book, some of these elements are more obscured. When we are so distant from something, it is very hard to validate whether the prophecy was even made at that time, and then came true after it was made. That the prophecy was made and then it came true afterward. Without going into too many details, I am personally aware of an individual in my past who likely did this very thing, who likely wrote down a prophecy after an event happened. It is certainly easy to prophesy about an event that has come true because it has already come true. Now, you can't possibly get it wrong, at least from that angle alone. When it comes to false prophets and false prophecy, we can recognize that there are some clear examples of what we would consider bad apples or what we would consider evil motivations to what they are doing. And while we can probably think of people falsely prophesying for the sake of personal gain, or trying to manipulate people into giving them money, or following them, or whatever, I think we should also consider what else can go on. Most people that claim to have heard something from Elohim likely do it with only positive intentions in mind. The reality is that all of us on some level are seeking guidance at the very least. We want to know the truth of what is commanded, and we want to know what the Creator wants us personally to be doing, at least on some level. And that might serve as motivation. It might serve as motivation to prophesy about something. Or it might serve as motivation for a person to think that Elohim has spoken to him or her personally to give that person validation or encouragement. Maybe that is the case, or maybe it is not. 
And there could be many other reasons that seem positive and motivate a person to presume to prophesy. And this could include a person feeling very strongly that someone else is in danger and needs to be convinced to either stop doing something or to do something in order to prevent that danger they feel strongly about. And this could even ironically be because of a person's zeal for truth and wanting to convince other people of the truth. Even whenever we sincerely want to avoid making stuff up, falsely prophesying, imagining that we're getting things that's actually just voices or feelings in our mind that our mind put together on its own, even when we genuinely are trying to avoid that, there may be some part of our mind that probably doesn't know the difference. There is some part of our mind that knows how we feel whenever we know what we are doing and we know is the right thing to do and we are encouraged and validated in doing so. There is a part of our mind that knows this is a good experience and that part of our mind may not care how we get to that experience because Ultimately, we feel the same way if we believe the prophecy, whether it is a false prophecy or a true prophecy. If we believe it, we feel just as led or just as validated either way. And if we happen to be in that sort of mindset and we are unsatisfied as far as our personal leadership validation and encouragement in our lives about the important things of our life, it might be very easy to go down that path unintentionally. And I want to reaffirm that I do believe legitimate prophecy can exist today, even though it is rare. However, I think it is often dangerous to try to seek it out and then proclaim it as fact. That's something I try to warn people about whenever someone close to me sounds like they are about to say that Elohim supposedly told them something. If it sounds like the conversation is going in that direction... I try to tell them to be cautious about it and to not claim any certainty on it unless you are absolutely sure. If a person says that he or she had a weird dream that seemed significant or heard something or felt something that seemed like it could be from Elohim while they were praying but the person's not really sure, if that were to happen and then the person was wrong, that's one thing. If the person said that they're not really sure and this experience seemed to happen but they're not really sure about it, that would be one thing. But if a person goes and says and proclaims that Elohim supposedly told them such and such, then he or she might be presuming to speak a word in his name which he did not speak. And that is the ultimate caution that I want to offer here. And when it comes to these issues of seeking prophecy, I think we can break that down into some different components. We can distinguish between issues of guidance, issues of leadership, validation, and encouragement. And when it comes to seeking those things, or at least seeking some of those things, for some people this is not really a concern. So even though all of us would probably want to know if something from Elohim needed to be told to us, there is a difference in how some people handle that desire. Some people know how to generate enough self-leadership and self-validation and self-encouragement to just proceed on the path that they have chosen without too much questioning of it. And I suspect that there are some people out there who have stumbled upon that ability to give themselves self-leadership and self-validation and self-encouragement by thinking that it is actually words from the Creator, without realizing that it is actually their own mind. People may have stumbled upon the ability to give themselves all of these things, this leadership, this validation, this encouragement, not realizing the actual source. Of course, they may not be getting what they want in terms of actual guidance from the Creator, but they are getting what they want to some degree in terms of experiencing leadership and validation and encouragement. So I think it is useful to separate between these things or to take note of the distinction. So now let's try a quick thought experiment. It will only take a few seconds and I think you will find it useful if you are willing to give it a try. 
So feel free to close your eyes and to breathe and relax briefly so that it will make it easier for you. Now, since everyone listening to this is concerned with what the Torah says and is interested in it, that means that we have read over these different experiences that took place in the wilderness, like the fire on the mountain with the giving of the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, where Elohim was speaking, or the experience that Moses had with the burning thorn bush, where Elohim spoke to him out of the fire there or with the experience of Elohim speaking to Moses and Aaron and Miriam before the Ten of Meeting. We all have this imagination that we have thought while we were reading about that, while we were thinking about that, of what it would be like being in the presence of that, witnessing Elohim speaking, hearing it, experiencing it, feeling it. And I want to encourage you that you can take a few seconds and imagine one of these experiences that are described in the narrative of the Torah, imagining it as if you were also there, as if you are witnessing it yourself, seeing out of your own eyes, hearing out of your own ears, feeling the feelings that are present there in that situation. If it's the giving of the ten words, you can see the great fire, maybe even feeling the heat from it and hearing the blasting of the horn and the tremendous and powerful voice. Or if it is one of the other situations, you can hear and see and feel that experience. And once we have done that as fully as we have chosen to do, you can recognize that our mind has the ability to create that in our imagination, even though we are not there, even though we did not witness that, even though we are not really experiencing those events right now. So our mind has a capability of generating something that might resemble those events or those experiences. And if you really took the time to get into it and imagine it, I am sure there was an impact to it, a heaviness to that experience. And if you didn't quite get there to the degree that you want, or if you just are listening to this doing something else, then I encourage rewinding a few seconds or pausing and feeling free to take the time that you need to get into that and to experience that, because I think you'll get more out of this if you do so. So for those that have gone through that, part of the reason I wanted to use this imagination is to illustrate the point which I've been attempting to make through most of this, that we have to be cautious with our mind with what may or may not be the creator actually speaking, because our mind has the ability to generate some sense of that experience, or at least something that we think resembles such an experience. But there is actually another reason I wanted to encourage doing that experience that goes beyond this. If we take away all the theological aspects to it, if we take away the prophecy aspect and the Elohim speaking aspect, I wanted to show that we have the ability to create within our mind a powerful voice that we respect and that we listen to. In this experiment, for those that went through it, we generated it in those contexts of biblical events. But what if we take that skill and develop it for additional uses? What if we take some of the qualities of the voice that we imagined and apply them to one of our own voices in our mind? Now, clearly, if I have been clear up to this point, you know I'm not suggesting to make up prophecies or pretend that Elohim supposedly said something or anything like that. You know I'm not referring to that. But I am suggesting that if we are looking for validation as we seek to follow the Torah and seek to do the right thing, because we have chosen to do this, because we believe it, because we already know it is the thing to do, it is just difficult whenever we get weighed down by whatever is going on in life or the fact that everyone around us is opposed to it or thinks we're doing the wrong thing. If we know that it is the right thing and we are seeking to do that, then this is something that you have the ability to do. When it comes to self-leadership, self-validation, self-encouragement, you can generate that in a mindful way that recognizes it is coming from you and that it is your own voice in your mind. You're not pretending to be anyone else. It is just you 
and it's you speaking with the qualities of leadership that you know how to create, that you know you have demonstrated how to create. I know for some of you this will just seem odd, and I know for some others that you are already doing this in some way that may not even be in your conscious awareness. You just learned how to do it from your parents or from some other source early in life. But for some of you, I think you will find this very useful to practice and to play with and to develop. You can lead yourself on the path of seeking Elohim and seeking what he wants, and you can work on developing a powerful version of that voice, your own voice in your mind, that you use to lead yourself on this path you've chosen. Whenever there is this absence of vision, or whenever there is an absence of prophecy, or whenever there is an absence of direct and explicit statement from the Creator. And that may even help us to distinguish between our own thinking and anything that may come from the Creator because there may be less demand by parts of our mind to falsify a word or falsify a feeling because our mind is already getting some of what we would have wanted through that. It doesn't have as much motivation to do those dangerous things. While we still want that guidance from Elohim, we are not as starved when it comes to the other aspects that we might be seeking. In the future, I expect there will be something which resembles the events of the wilderness in the narrative of the Torah. The people were thirsty, the people hungered, the people did not like being out in the wilderness and regretted leaving their captivity. Even though there was the pillar of fire and the ma and the manna, it was still easy for the people to get discouraged along the way and to question what they were doing, why they were doing it, and to not be willing to continue forward. This is something I believe we need to prepare ourselves for and that we need to prepare ourselves to handle whenever it starts to go on around us with the other people around us. The people in the wilderness had just witnessed great miracles done upon an entire nation before all of their eyes to see, and that was not enough to prevent doubting. And we all know what happened whenever the complaining and the doubting and the testing of Elohim by the people got out of hand. We read this frequently in the narrative of the Torah, and people have changed very little since then. We want to remember the treacherous ways of the false prophets, and think more thoroughly about the reality of that. Both modern times and ancient times may share more correlation than was previously obvious. We want to remember the commands about prophets in the Torah and recognize how that may be applied today, or recognize when it cannot fully be applied today and when we can't really know if a given prophet is true or false. And we can recognize the ability of the mind and how that ability can be used to generate some of what we might be looking for. That ability can be used in a legitimate way by just simply accepting and recognizing it as our own voice in our own mind. And by developing that voice into something useful. Or it can be mistakenly used in an illegitimate way and can lead a person to presume that it's not his or her voice and presume it is from some outside source. We want to make these distinctions as best as we can. I hope this has given some useful things to ponder with regard to the workings of prophecy and false prophecy. Guard the commands, stay focused, and be tenacious.